okay, hi everyone. Now we get to the exciting part of the Bush Blitz, which is when I take some of the questions that you guys emailed me and I get to ask them to the people that will have the answers. So first up we have Dr Jess, who is one of the spider experts on this trip. And she's one of the people that got a lot of questions headed her way. So thank you, Dr. Jess, for taking the time to answer them. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so the first question is, and this came from a few people, is that they talked about the fact that they kind of growing up hating spiders and thinking that they had to or wanted to kill any that they saw. So a few people asked, um, they were wondering why anyone would ever choose to study them. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And um, to be honest, probably most people I meet and talk to about spiders don't like spiders, and a lot of them are really scared of them. Um, I think spiders are really fascinating creatures. Like they're predators, which makes them really interesting. And they've got so many cool behaviours. Um, um, yeah, the more you look into them, kind of the more you see these things. Um, and I have always been interested in them, I think. Um, but yeah, the more you get to know them, you more, the more you've got to learn. It's a great world out there. Excellent. So just with that, yeah, it sounds like you've always been interested in them, even as a kid. Um, would you have any particular tips for anyone who didn't have that passion or didn't have that existing interest on how they could, how they could just get more used to them and more comfortable with them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I really believe that um, with spiders and with many things that the more you get to know them, the kind of the less scary they become and the more you can get to appreciate them. Um, once you look at spiders, like if you go and look at them in their webs or have a look down a burrow and if you can see if there's anyone in there, um, they get to become a lot more predictable and a lot less scary. Um, and yeah, so really I'd encourage people, if you can, just to go and watch them. Try and learn what you can. Look at books. You know, there's there's a lot to learn, um, and I think that really does help with fear. Awesome. Now, a couple of my students have asked the kind of question: Do you have a favourite family or a group of spiders in particular to study? But we have been talking about the fact that you are here looking for some specific spiders, and you've been lucky enough over the last couple of days to find them. Do you want to yeah. tell us tell us more about the tube webs? Yes. So yeah, I do have a favourite um, family of spiders called the tube web spiders. I've been working on this group probably uh, since about 2017 and I love them. Um, the spiders themselves are kind of not that exciting looking, generally kind of brown to black, about that size. Um, they live in tube webs um, that they build underneath bark in trees or under rocks or even in burrows in the ground and um, yeah I find them fascinating. There's lots of new species um, so lots to discover and really no one knows that much about them. So again, I've been watching them, kind of seeing what they do in the wild and yeah, so they're my favorites. <laughs> awesome. Um, a couple of kids have got this question. Have you ever been bitten by one of your creatures? And if so, have you ha ever had any bad side effects? Um, so yes, I've been bitten. In fact, I was bitten not that long ago by one of the tube web spiders that I work with. Um, I was in my backyard and I noticed some berries in a tree, some little tubers, so I was pulling them out and I only had thongs on and it dropped down onto my toe and bit me. And it was really interesting because I had lots of people ask me what it's like to be bitten by them and I couldn't answer before, uh, but now I can. And it wasn't really anything major. Hurt a little bit. I think the main thing, it was very itchy afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's rare to get bitten. Uh, most spiders really don't want to bite you um, and they only bite if they're provoked or if they get stuck in your clothes or things. Most of them just want to run away. Awesome. And then, yeah, we've got a few people that are interested in technology and gadgets at school mm -hmm. and a couple of them have been asking, at the moment, what is the most interesting, useful or essential piece of technology that you use in your day-to-day -day spider sort of yeah. studying work? Well, I use a bit of technology um, to be honest probably the most boring answer but the most useful thing is a mobile phone so I use that for taking photos for um, using as a GPS to record where we found things for taking field notes but the most exciting thing and the thing I love using is a what I call the spider cam and so this is a camera on a thin tube and it's about a meter long and I use it to put down uh, spiders burrows 
and so oh. I can watch the spiders inside and that's amazing because you can see them in their own little world and, awesome. and record videos of that and I love yeah. that. <laughs> nice. And lastly, this is just a question for me, as people have probably noticed, you've got an English accent. Yes. Um, could you tell uh, my students a little bit about, I guess, just the, uh, the possibilities that science careers can bring when it comes to yeah, travelling across the world or across countries yeah. and stuff like that? How, how did how did an English girl end up in Australia studying sports? <laughs> no, I mean, science is an amazing career if you choose to to follow it. It's, um, yeah, I started off in England. I worked in a museum there working with, uh, working on spiders and to be honest the spiders in England are all pretty boring. Um, they're all described as no new species, um, whereas in Australia um, there's just so many new species and so much to learn and yeah there's a lot of opportunities in a career in science to go to wonderful amazing places and to find out new stuff. It's really, it's like exploring, investigating and learning. Awesome. And lastly, I just remembered we've got a couple of examples of spiders behind us here. Is there anything in particular you could point out to the kids at home? Yeah, well, we've got this big male, um, here's a big male wishbone spider, we call him. And he, um, this family, they are called wishbone spiders because they live in burrows that are kind of Y-shaped, a bit like the shape of wishbone. This is a big male, and the males, when they become mature, they leave their burrows and they wander around looking for females. So the difference in life lengths between males and females is quite interesting. So these males, because they leave their burrows, they stop eating um, and wander around. They'll only live for about a year and a half, whereas the females, they'll stay in their burrows their whole life, and they can live up to 40 years. So it's a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So they're, they're a great group of spiders. Awesome. Oh. Yep, we've got an ant spider here. It's another nice little one. Um, so that's these spiders live with ants, and they um, copy ants. So they fool ants into letting them into their nests. When they're in there, they eat them. Ah. So yeah, they're great. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. No worries, thank you. So, uh, hopefully, the people back at home have enjoyed it. <laughs>So yeah, I'm back asking smart people your questions and this time we've got Aaron and Ben who are our resident wasp experts. So wasps and bees was one area that quite a few of you had questions about and these guys are spending a little bit of time helping answer them. So thanks for being here guys. No problem. Um, yeah, first up, a few of my students had basically why are wasps important? Um, what do they do that makes them worth investigating? Yeah, wasps are really, really important in the environment. So a lot of people know that bees are pollinators and bees are really important for moving pollen between different plants so that we can have more plants. 
um, which is obviously important so that we have food to eat uh, but wasps are really important as pollinators too so that's one job they do in the environment mm-hmm. wasps are also predators in the environment so they actually control the populations of other insects because they use them as a food source and that is uh, one of the things that I work on are wasps that attack caterpillars and so some of the wasps I work on uh, can be biocontrol agents which means that they can attack caterpillar pests in crops and help keep those pest numbers down, which is good for the crop production. Mm -hmm. Awesome, that actually, yeah, kind of answers one of our questions. One of my students in particular was wondering if this kind of field had any kind of, I guess, real world everyday implications, but yeah, the idea that they can actually be used to control some serious agricultural pests is quite interesting. Have either of you guys done any work on that in particular, or is that just stuff that you're aware of? Yeah, um, at the moment I'm working um, with a pest called full armyworm, which is coming in from northern Australia. Um, it's a caterpillar that's attacking a, quite a few different crops in Australia, and so we're rearing the wasps out of it and trying to get an idea of how much they're parasitising it and whether they're able to help uh, keep the numbers down. Awesome. What's really interesting about these wasps, uh, and especially the parasitic ones, is that they attack all sorts of different insect hosts. So I actually work on some funny wasps that like to target native bees. And so it's really interesting to kind of work out how the wasps and the bees kind of work together in the ecosystem and how they affect each other. And when we were driving around the other day, you were saying that there were some that target cockroaches as well. So uh, do you know if that includes any of the introduced feral cockroaches or yeah definitely so that group of wasps are a group of wasps called hatchet wasps and they actually are these little tiny black wasps that like to lay their eggs inside the egg cases of cockroaches and so we often see them inside our houses Uh, you might see them on the window and they're little tiny black wasps with blue eyes and they're the species that target the um, main american cockroach which is our international pest yeah Mm. awesome um, yeah, a lot of people had this question, you probably get asked it a lot, but uh, how often do you get stung by wasps or bees while you're at work? Well, so I personally haven't been stung in a very long time, but that's because I tend to be very careful with a lot of the stinging wasps, but most of the wasps that I work on and Erin work on uh, don't actually have stings. So although most people just think about wasps as having that venom injecting stinger, we actually work on parasitic wasps. So instead of injecting venom, they have an egg laying straw, which they use to inject eggs into things. So they actually can't sting. I've never been stung in the field either. So we do sometimes get some wasps in our nets and when we're out catching, that could give you a pretty nasty sting. Um, Like this one here, which is a a spider hunting wasp. That's a big one. Um, And she probably would sting you in defence, even though she's a parasitoid. She does have a fairly sharp ovipositor, which is what that stinger has adapted into to um, lay her eggs. But uh, we are always really careful when we're putting them in vials and collecting them. And I don't know if you want to explain a little bit more about her life cycle, because she's really cool. Yeah, well, as Erin's saying, these are fantastic wasps. So these spider hunting wasps, Uh, actually hunt spiders, they then um, capture them, they sting them and paralyze them. They then drag them all the way back to a burrow that she dug, she digs earlier, and then she lays a single egg on it and then seals the burrow. So the spider is then uh, paralyzed and it's alive, and the wasp larvae eats it. Uh, And so once it's consumed the whole spider, it then pupates into an adult wasp and climbs out of the burrow. Nice. Very interesting. So, I guess, obviously you guys are used to handling potentially venomous animals and doing it safely, but are there any animals you come across in your like field work that you actually don't like or dislike or are still just as scared of as maybe the average person mm-hmm. out there? I'm not a fan of cockroaches, even though I know they're very important and I respect them. Uh, just probably the one insect that I still don't like. Well, there's none that I really dislike, but one that I am a little bit scared of is still centipedes. I find them very impressive invertebrates, they're very powerful, they're very fast, so whenever working with them I'm always trying to keep my wits about me. Yeah, being respectful of uh, what they might be able to do if they latch on you. 
Awesome. Um, yeah, a few of my students are interested in technology and gadgets and that kind of stuff. So one of the questions we've been asking our interviewees is, at the moment, what do you guys see or see as maybe your favourite, most interesting, most uh, essential, almost useful piece of tech that you use in, a, in your job? Ooh, I guess a piece of technology we carry around in our pocket all the time is our phone, but in the field we use it all the time. So we use it to take pictures of the insects as we're collecting them and of the habitat where we find it. Um, and being able to take a picture in the field means we can upload it to things like iNaturalist, which you can do at home and at school as well, to get identifications from people really easily online. Uh, it also gives us a GPS, we can put notes down about what we found, um, can do all kinds of things. So. Yeah, the phone is super awesome, but probably the less like technology one would be the nets that we use. Uh, and we can have some uh, really, really long nets to allow us to get up really high in the canopy. And I've only had one of those for the last few months and it's been very exciting to <laughs> get really tall in the trees yeah. now. Yeah. It makes things a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bigger reach. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's always some um, interesting things up in the top of trees because sometimes you might have different insects that will be foraging in the canopy. And so normally you wouldn't be able to reach those or have access to them by having these longer nets where we're able to actually sample at those tops of trees. Excellent, Ooh. nice. And the last question, and this is one of my questions, I've been listening to a podcast lately at someone who interviews scientists, and she always finishes off with asking what are your most favorite or and least favorite aspects of your job? Well, my most favourite is actually coming out into the field and collecting insects. I love being out here. We always find something new and exciting, and it's just so nice to be out in the bush. It's always just great. It's excellent. I think my favourite is when I get to work with people who aren't scientists. So when I get to work with school kids or um, with people who are just passionate about a particular area of bush or, and get to share that excitement of discovery with them. I think that would be my favourite. Least favourite is probably doing admin on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> that and long drives. <laughs> Excellent. I can relate to both of those things too. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. And hopefully the next week in a bit goes uh, well for you both. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. So look, there's these little tiny yellow bees we can see. Yes, I saw them in the park. That are completely yellow. And they belong to a subfamily called the Uroglossine, uh, Uroglossini. And so these guys are actually eucalyptus specialists. So then the orangey ones, are they different to the yellow ones? Or it's just colour yep. variation? Yeah, so these will all be different little species. So definitely they look different. these yeah. yellow Sorry. ones and orange ones are going to be really interesting. Hi again everyone, um, yeah, we're back interviewing more scientists and this time we've got Jasper and Ollie who are up and coming marine biologists. So yeah, we, my school's a coastal school so a lot of these guys had questions about marine science. First up, you probably get this a fair, fair bit, but some of my students want to know, do you see, ever see any dangerous sea animals like great white sharks? And if so, have you or your team ever had any close calls? Yeah, so there are a lot of dangerous marine animals and a lot of them occur offshore, so like these great white sharks. So a lot of our team do work with um, white sharks, but all the procedures that are in place, um, so the shark cage diving as well as Catching the sharks, it's all pretty much hands off, so you barely physically touch them, so it is all safe and above board. Um, the most dangerous marine animal that we probably um, deal with are blue ringed octopus. So when we're on the rocky reefs, we have to be really careful looking through rock pools, um, turning over rocks just in case if we encounter one of them. As well as the, these little guys here, crabs, they have quite a bit of a nip on them so you gotta be careful with these guys or they will get you and they will hang off of your finger for hours <laughs> so yeah there are a lot of dangers involved but there's a lot of procedures and um methods in place to keep us as safe as possible as well as the animals as safe as possible 
Cool, cool. Is uh, any of the equipment you guys use potentially dangerous or is that all pretty straightforward? I think when you're in the water, the most dangerous thing you'll come across is another boat, of course. Um, other than that, I think a lot of tool, big heavy tools, the biggest danger is always if you're going to drop it on your foot or something. Um, largely, we always are pretty well trained with what we're using, so we'll never injure ourselves. Cool, cool. So yeah, a few of these guys have asked basically how did you get into marine biology? Is that something that you were always interested in as kids or did it come along as you got towards university or? Yeah, so I've been snorkeling along the coastline for my entire life so it was just kind of a natural progression into marine biology and in high school when I started to do biology it turns out I was pretty good at it, so I just kind of put my passion for snorkeling and biology together and here we are now, yeah. Awesome. I think I've always had a passion for conserving the ocean and a real desire to explore more of the water. So I've always been interested in marine biology, but coming into adulthood and having the skills of a diver, it just naturally flowed in. Awesome. Um, how did you guys end up exploring rocky reefs as a, speci or as a specialty within marine biology in general? Yeah, so it just sort of happened because I had been snorkeling all along these rocky shorelines and so whenever I got to do a project in high school or university, I was always on the rocky shorelines investigating and I guess the most important thing is try and find a habitat or a species that you're interested in and just ask why, why does it do this? Why does it live here? Um, how does it interact with other species? Um, so yeah, rocky reefs is a very good habitat um, and very challenging to work in, but also um, very good to work in as well. Um, yeah. As all the species there are incredible to look at and research. And Ollie here does a little bit deeper stuff on so on the deeper rocky reefs. I do. I look at mesophotic systems, which are about 30 to 150 metres. But I really got into it because I've always been more interested in lots of things. So it's hard if you have all these different organisms you're interested in. You don't want to just study one and forget about the rest. So if you look at reef ecosystems, the whole thing, you get to look at all these different animals and not have to specialise in just one specific thing. Cool, cool. And yeah, we, um, like, we hear a lot about the coral reef systems, but it turns out that the cold water reefs are actually like really biodiverse as well, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of different habitats and the rocky reefs create a lot of different um, micro habitats. So you've got underneath rocks, um, as well as habitats on other organisms as well. So you can have snails and barnacles growing on other limpets and other organisms. So it's a very, very complex habitat and all the different algae species as well um, were on different um, ecological communities. So everywhere you look, you'll find something new. It's also worth noting that uh, in a few recent years, we've, a lot of scientists have tried to define these southern temperate reefs we got as one big one called the Great Southern Reef and all in all it stretches from about halfway down Western Australia all the way across the just the bottom of Queensland absolutely massive and all like pretty much just as important as the Great Barrier Reef but not nearly as much publicity about it. They're cool. Yeah and that's like our, our hometown is smack bang in the middle of that so it's something that a lot of my kids will probably uh, spend a fair bit of their outside time kicking around on and looking at and fishing on top of and surfing on top of so it's, it's good to know that it's actually potentially really important. Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of kids had this question they said oh, what's so interesting about marine invertebrates and are they important? Yeah so they're almost the most important thing in these ecosystems so they don't get enough publicity like these big sharks and whales but they act as the base of the food web so they feed upon the algae and the plankton in the water and act as a link between these primary producers that produce all the energy and these larger organisms so without these marine invertebrates um, the sea would be desolate without anything living in there yeah so 
they're the building blocks of yeah. everything. And we need a lot more people researching them, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and last question I've got from my students is, have either of you discovered anything really unique yet while you've been working in this field? Is uh, not so much unique, um, but just the different communities on all the different rocky reefs. Um, no matter what shoreline you go to, you will find something different, something new, another question to ask um, about these habitats. But the most exciting thing is when you lift up a rock and crabs go scuffling around or you see a blue ringed octopus under there, um, it's a really good habitat to work in. And what we're finding on this trip is, unlike a lot of the places along the metro shores, everything's bigger. So it's just another one of those things that even if you're not finding any particularly new species, you're still finding differentiation within those same groups. Nice. And is there got any theories on why they might be bigger? Is it age or...? Yeah, so what um, I think is that it's a case of a lack of human predation. So along the metro shoreline, there's a lot more people, um, these organisms are more exposed to crushing pressures as well as people taking them for food or for bait, um, or that just doesn't happen here as yeah. much, and yeah. Interesting, interesting. And lastly, I know down at our feet we've got a couple of samples of stuff, is there anything here that you want to show people? Yeah, so like I showed you guys before, there was that little crab, but we also... <laughs> you always get wet in marine biology. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 Don't no, no, be scared. No, 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 no. So this is one of the limpets here. And so we look on the underside, so it's just a snail and it feeds upon the biofilms along the rocky shorelines and the very young algae. And so it keeps the rocks clear of algae which allow other species to grow. And so even though they might not be the most exciting looking animals, they um, everything has their role within that ecosystem. Nice. Okay, well, yeah, don't have any more questions, so thanks for your time. Yeah, no we'll worries. let you go out and do some more exploring. Yeah, too easy. Thanks, mate. Thank you. I'm here with Josh Dennis from Flinders University out at Point Fowler. Josh has just been on an exploratory dive. Can you show us a couple of the things that you found out there, Josh? Yeah, sure thing. So this, uh, this is the coral that we've been uh, in particular looking for. So it's a hard um, fan-like coral that's uh, usually found in more warmer tropical waters. So there's a potential range extension there. Some really cool starfish. I'll pick these up with my gloves just, to, just in case. So some really cool colours. Yeah, nice. How was it down there? Oh, it was beautiful. Big, uh, big overhangs filled with all the uh, different um, sea fans. Really, really colourful and kind of came in underneath the island there and just uh, you could look up and it was just big, opened up into these big rooms. It was really, really cool. Oh, that sounds awesome. Thanks for sharing. No worries.